Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's uh, webinar uh, titled Addressing uh, the Goals of COP26 in uh, South Asian uh, Context, People, and Explications, uh, hosted by the Center for Governance Studies, uh, CCS. Uh, thank you for spending some time with us uh, today. Uh, we are now live on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. Uh, as a stakeholder of the society for the past few years, uh, we are focused to address uh, the challenges uh, for for Bangladesh in coping with the uh, rapidly changing national and global scenarios. Uh, the center aims to facilitate uh, collaboration efforts among uh, the academic community, uh, government, private sector, civil society, uh, and uh, development partners to discuss and change ideas of the issues which uh, need to be looked upon. Uh, our domain includes uh, climate change and governance. Uh, which is one of the major concerns of the academic and policy arena, uh, not only in Bangladesh, but also in the global uh, scenario. Uh, this year, the 26th uh, UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties COP26 uh, will be hosted by the United Kingdom in Glasgow. Uh, the slogan of the COP26 is uniting uh, the world to tackle climate change, emphasizing uh, the importance of international cooperation to address climate change. In light of the COP26, the Center for Governance Studies is organizing this webinar, focusing on both the COP26 and uh, current climate issues in Bangladesh and South Asia. Uh, the webinar is uh, set to focus on addressing the following issues, uh, uh, climate issues faced by South Asian countries, uh, barriers of implementation, the goals of COP26 in the South Asian context, uh, collaboration, uh, climate resilient development, and our responsibility towards future generation, uh, role of the stakeholders, that is think tanks, NGOs, uh, to achieve a climate friendly resolution. Uh, and there are a few more things. How do people feel about climate change? Uh, how is climate change being uh, talked about? How does all of these affect our uh, behavior? Uh, today we have a very distinguished and excellent uh, panel to discuss about all these issues we have and will have with us Dr. Atik Rahman, Executive Director, Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies, Architect Mubashir Hussain, President, Institute of Architects, Bangladesh, Ms. Soda Rizwana Hassan, Chief Executive, Bangladesh Environment Lawyers Association, Bela, uh, Professor yes. Rashid Al-Mahmud Titimir, Chair, IUCN National Committee in Bangladesh, Architect Mubash Iqbal Habib, Member Secretary, Bangladesh, Puribesh Andolan Bapa, and Dr. Monjur Ahmed Choudhury, Chairman, Center for Governance Studies, CGS. And uh, we're very happy uh, that we have with us uh, a chief guest, uh, British High Commissioner to Bangladesh, His Excellency Robert Chatterton Dixon. Thank you, Mr. High Commissioner, for your kind presence. Uh, before we go further, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, your active participation is important throughout the uh, session. Right now, I'm requesting everyone on mute to avoid uh, background noises that may distract you, uh, you from uh, listening uh, to the webinar. Uh, throughout the presentation, someone on staff uh, will be managing uh, the chat functionality. We can enter your questions and comments in the question box throughout the presentation. Uh, if you'd rather ask in person, you can also use uh, the icon on the counter panel uh, to raise your hand uh, to indicate that you have a question or comment. Uh, now, without further ado, let me start with uh, Dr. Atik Rahman. Uh, Dr. Rahman is a prominent environmentalist, a scientist, a development expert, and a visionary thinker in South Asia. Uh, he is uh, well known worldwide for his uh, pioneering role and contribution to environment and nature conservation, uh, climate change, poverty elevation, and sustainable development. He was honored with the highest United Nations Environmental Award, the champion of the earth, uh, for the year 2008 uh, in recognition of his outstanding and inspirational leadership and contribution uh, globally, regionally, nationally, and locally to the protection and sustainable management of the Earth's environment and natural resources. So Dr. Atik Raman, microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, Your Excellency, the High Commissioner, let me call you Robert and uh, we have met many times and soon again we'll probably have further discussion. I am really in um, Grand Sultan in uh, a Sri Mongol area, many of you might know. This is, I'm on a sort of retreat of um, 18 members of parliament who are 
being who have a caucus on climate change and migration, particularly on human migration in Bangladesh, uh, which is now dominantly climate induced. So we are hoping to discuss with them. You cannot train parliamentarians, so we entered into discourse, but it's quite a rigorous sort of uh, discussion and training based on a number of issues. The key migration thinkers are here. So we are going ahead and doing that for the last two days. Today is the third day. So uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but nonetheless, this is as good as it gets. Uh, as to the COP26, I have had the privilege to uh, be participatory in the COP process, in the climate process, and in the climate convention writing process pre-1992 from 88 to 92. Then 92 to 95 was a pre-COP. There were international uh, summit meetings, but it never turned into conference of party because of the, as you know, 55-55 rule of 55 countries, which adds up minimum to a 55% of the total emission of that time. So when that is reached, then the conference of the party could start. So it delayed quite a bit. And then there has been 25 conferences of the party. And we are into the 26th one uh, looking forward in Glasgow. Um, even two weeks ago, I was a bit pessimistic. But uh, with the Bangladesh uh, conditions uh, being COVID dominated, and we were in the red list very recently, uh, the UK uh, has eliminated the red list of Bangladesh. So there is likelihood that people could be present, those who have had uh, two um, uh, vaccinations, uh, and, and they are of some resistance that can be built in. I'm still a bit, um, there is a sort of 5 to 20 percent probability that um, direct participation of many may not be possible. You know that in conference of party, the parties, which are all the nation states, 206 of them, consists of about 2,000 to 3,000 people, but it's 20,000 people who turn up. Now, Glasgow isn't a very big uh, city with respect to mega conferences like this, but nonetheless, every possible uh, accommodation uh, within and around Glasgow has been um, consumed and uh, very few opportunities are left. Nonetheless, um, we look forward to be there, going there and participating. Bangladesh government will go with a pretty big delegation. Some of us may be included in the government. We are waiting for the final um, thinking of what uh, that is the decision that the government at the highest level will have to take. Now, as to the content, there is a slight glimmer of hope with respect to the fund part, which is the hundred so-called hundred billion dollar. Now, this hundred billion dollar coming out from Paris Agreement is a hundred billion dollar per year. Now, it's all together in the last five years, not much has happened. So in accumulation, $100 billion doesn't make much sense because most countries are spending more than $20 billion. Bangladesh is spending about 10 to $12 billion just on climate adaptation. We are, I happen to be the uh, team leader of the Bangladesh uh, National Determined Contribution Study or the report which is basically the mitigation plan for Bangladesh. We have done that. I think it's a good job done. And we have reported it back to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It has shown tremendously well how many things has happened, which is pro-climate emission control. Big example, the whole course opening of the um, Padma Bridge will usher a new direction in which, though many cars will travel through that bridge, uh, the total miles saved for people and the hours saved and the petrol saved therein is a huge amount. That is our contribution to this system. Our so-called uh, improved stokes in hundreds of millions is being now going across the country and people are being more using 
uh, more advanced use so that the cooking stove do not emit as much and with half the emission of burning um, wood we can reduce it as to the coal there is a greater consciousness within the government to reduce the coal consumption and it is coming out of the production of electric process the decision has been made the procedures are step wise and bangladesh at this time is going through a real very progressive electricity connection now i for one as a citizen of the globe i believe that every citizen has the right to electricity has right to efficient systems has right to uh, the energy use which can be done best for the country for themselves for their families and their aid i had the privilege of um, pioneering and starting the photovoltaic revolution in bangladesh which i am now coming a revolution we want when we started we thought that was an opportunity and we were started with a village uh, around near notching bay in the middle of the river in which 1000 household or 1000 household was going to be electrified and i thought that if somehow we could do 10000 household we would have done our job most recently the prime minister told us that 5.5 5.58 million uh, households are now electrified with solar photovoltaic each household is a fi- average five member so we are talking about 22 million people of bangladesh are getting direct lighting benefit and some on irrigation benefit out of solar solar photovoltaic something that i along with my team started a small today has already grown into big and the number of users the 22 million is the world's largest number of usage uh, users in photovoltaic though we are not the largest user in the wattage of the voltage total amount of electricity used because that germany is ahead of us and several other uh, european countries so in a sense we are doing reasonably well out of this 22 million people about 4 to 5 million children are being educated and able to go to school because of the lighting they get in the evening which enables them to do their homework prepare themselves psychologically they are much better off physically they are better off and health wise and with all that so tremendous progress is going on as to the cop 26 we will have to take the great messages from bangladesh our prime minister is likely to be leading the delegation so if that happens she is already abroad now for other trips so we hope she can lead the bangladesh and we will be there so bangladesh will go with a very progressive plan progressive thinking and contribute so that is the what we will do but what the cop will do this time it has to ensure that the long term commitment that various countries have given to reach their zero emission target are already around the point but the dates vary widely that has to be brought down to 2030 2040 2050 to you know where we are if we cross 1.5 degree centigrade by end of this century we would be in real trouble 2 degrees too much though that is the commitment under paris agreement given all that let's just say that cop 26 would definitely be a, a very good point at which heads of governments and many politically very loaded it will be the only thinking and decision but the technical part we have to ensure it's not no more the point of talking it's a point of doing implementation 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 on emission targets and for bangladesh our implementation essentially is adaptation is the focus and adaptation and we are talking here migration if people are forced to migrate with increasing salinity which is already happening and the bangladesh is going to be one of the greatest uh, internally displaced group of people in the world as a result we must ensure those people have their right not only to be displaced from their own land but be enabled to continue a life of dignity and what we are proposing to the government is the 100 new um uh, economic zones that has been considered has to be planned in such a way these are climate friendly accommodating the migrant 
depopulation and climate induced migration will have to become a major issue so what we are doing in bangladesh what we will do in cop26 and overall what will happen in cop26 are the, the three points that i wanted to make uh, in this morning unfortunately i have to give a lecture here to the parliamentarians so i'll beg leave from you but i hope i have made some points which will stimulate your discussion thank you zilu thank you uh, mr high commissioner and we'll be again back i'll be back in dhaka tomorrow and hopefully we'll be carrying on our discussion and i'll talk to uh, robert sometime soon and uh, start discussing few of the other things better deeper uh, very soon thank you very much for giving me this opportunity zilu i'm most grateful to you for bearing with me in this uh, under stress timetable that you have got all the best thank you very much thank you dr atik kaman thank you for joining us from sri mangal and uh, for your insightful speech uh, now i would like to request mr iqbal habib to take the floor uh, iqbal habib is among the most known environmental activists and architects of the country he is the member secretary of bangladesh environment oh, movement oh. bangladesh puribesh andolan of bapa uh, active organizer and a public voice of some of the facing environmental and urban issues mr iqbal habib oh. Oh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dilu Rama. Uh, first of all, I am very. Uh, yes. So thank you very much for giving me the floor. I think uh, after uh, uh, listening to uh, Mr. Atik Rahman, I'm not going to come up with a uh, lot of uh, data, but I would rather uh, speak on um, some of the burning issues which we think that uh, in terms of adaptation, we need to focus. I believe uh, the whole world is... having two uh, motivation in this uh, fighting with uh, climate change one is to uh, raise funds for those who are going to suffer and try to mitigate their sufferings and make the whole world as uh, fighting as one but another one is adaptation for individual countries and uh, maybe individual uh, sect of people and from my side i would like to uh, raise our concern about uh, uh, five uh, issues one is the urbanization uh, and urban agenda you see it is obvious that uh, bangladesh is going to suffer uh, hugely uh, in terms of migration from rural to town though i believe the government has taken a very strong step uh, my village my uh, town and my village uh, program which is basically to take all the facilities uh, be it uh, technological be it uh, public amenities uh, which is available in cities to village but i think uh, any of such uh, steps is not going to stop the migration from rural to city and it is calculated that almost 50% of the people will be in the cities and cities like dhaka is more than overcrowded almost 47800 people per square kilometer in the city corporation areas and that is making things unbearable now having this unbearability we would always feel that the whole if all world things that they can come together we need to have the housing technology block development with modular technology and also a huge support in housing fund unfortunately having this as one of the fundamental right of the people cities are lacking hugely to have proper uh, housing solution from uh, middle income to uh, down uh, lower income which is uh, frustrating and also 
the funding for for this sector is hugely uh, inefficient and in terms of management and also insufficient in terms of amount i think uh, the kind of uh, you know a billion dollar uh, commitment and uh, also a uh, billion dollar promise i should say it is obvious the technologies and the know how are available all around the world but we need to understand it's not only the money it sometimes it's it's sharing the knowledge sharing the technology sharing the uh, the innovations would be greatly helpful for uh, countries like ours still we are uh, using barn brick we are uh, in a in a in a in a kind of uh, oblivion state to understand how fast we can shift our barn brick to a uh, concrete block or more sustainable and environment friendly construction material in these areas there is a huge uh, possibilities of just transfer technology and assisting supporting uh, this sort of industries or this sort of construction modality paradigm shifting uh, by the assistance of each other and i think that is an area i would like to take note that that our discussion and uh, our uh, honorable high commission will raise this to his country and other european states to come forward and make sure that countries like ours have this technological support to take care of ourselves by ourselves by our own means second is nature based technology for water and sanitation management you see our waters are polluted rivers are polluted because of the density population urbanization and 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 inefficient and almost incapable management of the sewer as well as uh searching for uh, portable water we are just bringing water from our aquifer continuously this this cannot go on so having the technology sustainable technology of course for uh, portable water management from surface water not ground water and also sustainable nature based means and management for our water on the canals on our retention pond in our retention pond also the natural river around us which we are we are we are polluting enormously we also need efficient uh, technical assistance in start of in, 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 in terms of uh, housing and and building formation and also our infrastructural development you see unfortunately our infrastructure development cost per kilometer be it the road be it bridge even be it uh, construction sector is one of the highest in the world and we are one of the you know uh, 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 one of the one of the country was trying to be uh, you know uh, going beyond our poverty level so it 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 needs the innovation and technology and of course a kind of uh, easy funding in this particular area i believe environment equity must be an important area of investment nowadays and i i don't find that we are really having this in terms of equi- equity and as a result even the development in our transportation sector in the city are all based on private owners cars microbuses or or motorcycles and everything we are not yet having a public transportation system uh, pedestrian domain uh, movement and of also non motorized transportation based uh, possibilities and hence or or invested i think this five areas has to be uh, focused uh, in our discussions with our uh, other part of the world that we don't only want uh, assistance in terms of billion dollar promise which is i don't know when it going to be <laughs> implemented your promises are always promises but i think the technological support i think the investment in technology technological transfer and also maybe some investment plan on on financial uh, uh, management could be a great help it can be just a win win situation in terms of uh, financial support or funding 
that where you can you can take the benefit not only the social improvement benefit but also maybe a small uh, amount of uh, interest but i think the more bigger interest is uh, the changing of the life uh, lifestyle uh, management and changing of the capability to adapt to the situation it is uh, obvious if i can uh, make another point by telling you to example which is go beyond dhaka if you go to chitagong you'll find the salinity which is grasping the whole uh, drainage system uh, whole livelihoods uh, management in chitagong area just because the water level uh, rises uh, very very fast in last 10 years and as a result the city is having a unique scenario which we are not even capable of handling but i think there are many countries who has the technology who has uh, also the knowledge based institutions which can just uh, put their hand with us and make sure we can have the capacity to adapt and this adaptability is not just a word it has to be a partnership and i i am very pretty i'm very sure and pretty much convinced that if we can take this point with a focus area our partnership our alliances can be more uh, justified and practical and sustainable development means we have to have these uh, development philosophy urbanism not urbanization the urban philosophy based on equity based on environment uh, sustainability and that might uh, make a sus- just and sustainable economic growth for our country i will end up here with with the hope that i, I am talking about a very focused area but i'm sure you understand when 50% of the country people will be in the cities we have to be prepared and this preparedness need some assistance because it's all happening because of the climate change i believe that uh, this kind of sector of discussion will make ourselves much more capable and will definitely endure these challenges with with bigger pers- perspective and equity thank you very much for having me thanks uh, mr ikbal habib for your uh, thoughtful speech uh, now i want to move to professor rashid al mahmud titumir uh, dr titumir is the chair of iucn national committee in uh, bangladesh he is a professor of economics uh, at the department of development studies of the university of dhaka uh, he is currently holding uh, the charge of the chair chairman of the department he is also the founding chairperson of the unnon on nation a multidisciplinary independent think tank uh, professor uh, titumir you have been in the iucn world uh, conservation congress uh, recently in france so what's your take on uh, uh, france to glasgow mr uh, titumir is your thought Uh, thank you so much uh, uh mr moderator mr jillu rahman and cgs for organizing this timely webinar his excellency high commissioner and the fellow uh, panelists obviously while marse beaches tick all the right boxes inlets carved out of limestone cliffs idyllic boat trips to nature reserves or to play sport or to party with friends on sandy islands and romantic swims in private nooks and crannies but i would like to talk about gabura and if time permits then i would talk about the takeaways from the marse discussion so let's turn our focus on gabura and try to understand the linkages between gabura and glasgow two cyclones amidst the covid-19 struck the coastlines in bangladesh with the waves of the sea take the form of monster roads houses croplands fields shops were washed away by the tidal waves many people died millions rendered homeless the carcasses of cattle and wild animals float in the river forest deer of the sundarbans came to the locality in search of shelter countless people who have lost relatives homes and livelihoods have been hit by new storms before returning to a normal life on the one side abura is the 
turbulent Kolpetua River, and the other side is the strong current driven Kopotakko River. Cyclones, tidal surges, floods are the constant companions of the people of Dabura. Due to the continuous erosion of the river, these locality is getting smaller and smaller. The sixth assessment report of the IPCC, compiled by 134 scientists from six countries, paints a picture of the plight of the world's climate endorsed people, including those of Dabura. After the cyclones, Cedar, Isla, Bulbul, Foni, Ampan, Yas, in Shatkira and Kunla, the ancestral Vita or homesteads have gone into riverbeds. Many are forced to leave the Vita of seven generations. They have to take shelter on the embankments. Almost every year, embankments get broken and the localities are flooded. The severity of the disasters is increasing day by day. The destructions are accumulating. The people of the coast have somehow survived by constantly struggling with storms, tidal surges, and floods, what we all call resilience, and celebrate too. According to the IPCC report, climate change will increase the incidence of cyclones, tidal surges, and floods in Bangladesh and 11 other countries in the coming days. Thus, there are all kinds of natural disasters that the world has not seen in the last 2,000 years. The report warns that the situation is now spiraling out of control. Rising temperature has a relationship with increased propensity of cyclones, tidal surges, and floods. After the Industrial Revolution, the global temperature has risen by 1.1 degrees Celsius. During this period, the Indian Ocean has become more heated. As a result, the monsoon winds are getting stronger and cause, causing more rainfalls. That is why floods are increasing along the banks of the rivers. At the rate at which the world is emitting carbon, the rise in temp temperature cannot be limited to one and a half degrees Celsius, not even two degrees Celsius, according to the Paris Agreement. The bottom line, there is no time at hand to tackle climate change. We have to take effective steps to deal with it as an emergency. The United Nations conference is set to begin on November 1st in Glasgow and we'll discuss on how much the states will reduce their carbon emissions in the coming days. At the same time, discussion will be held on what can be done to reduce the sufferings of people endangered by climate change in different parts of the world like Gabura. Hamida Khatun, a resident of Gabura Union in Shatkira, was talking to me and our researcher of the Unnan Nation about the plights of the residents. According to her, the embankment was broken by cyclone Isla and the entire Gabura was submerged in salt water. Since then, there has been a severe shortage of drinking water. The water level is not available, even at a depth of 250 to 30, 300 feet. They have to run for miles in search of drinking water. Dabura has only one deep tubal for 39,000 people. Most families depend on drinking water directly from the pond. Nazma Begum said that the water of the pond became saline due to frequent storms and tidal surges. The situation became more deplorable. Reproductive health problems of women are evident everywhere. Children are malnourished. Amida Khatun added that they could not go to district or Upojela hospital for treatment due to lack of transportation facilities. Although services are taken from some local private clinics, these are neither adequate and nor of quality. Saidul Ghazi, a local, said that after Ailea, the cropland has become saline. Now paddy is no longer cultivated in these lands due to increased salinity. Going to successive tidal surges, the plants do not grow well anywhere anymore. Green plants, fresh water is decreasing day by day due to increasing salinity. Most of the agricultural lands are now used for crab and shrimp farming. Many coastal locals, including Dabura, have far fewer shelters than they need. Most of the developing countries have submitted to the UN to place to reduce carbon emissions, which is known as NDCs. While countries with the highest carbon emitters, like the United States, 
China and India are lagging behind the in NDC submission. The UNFCC says that even if the countries that have already submitted NDCs, if those were achieved, the United Nations Secretary General yesterday, day before yesterday says it would take light years. The world is using 120% more fossil fuels than required to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Despite its commitment to tackle climate change, multilateral development banks continue to invest in fossil fuel-based energy projects. The Arch World, a German-based environment group, says the World Bank invested more than 1.2 billion since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. What about most effective energy solutions along with technology transfer to the developing countries for transitioning to renewables. China plays yesterday that they wouldn't, find, uh, uh, wouldn't uh, finance the cold fire station. Let's see. This nation plays 100 billion a year, a 50-50 divide between the adaptation and mitigation. The reality turns out people in some of the poorest countries are getting only one dollar per capita per year to deal with the effects of the climate crisis. As of today, the British, British Prime Minister showed up to 60 percent of 100 billion and that to 11 billion promised by US President, which depends upon the Congress and, as you all know, mercy of Senator Manson and Republican senators. Developed countries are making places without effective measures which are in conflict with the Paris Agreement. For example, in the run-up to the conference, the host country, the United Kingdom, reduced its overseas aid from 0.7% to 0.5% of GDP, renewed oil and gas exploration in the North Sea, and reduced incentives for electric vehicles. Such decision conflict with the promise to reduce carbon emission to zero. Although not responsible for climate change, Bangladesh is one of the most affected countries. Added to these is the increased pressure of the forcibly displaced Rohingya population of Myanmar. More than 600 acres of forest have been destroyed since Myanmar's million displaced Rohingyas crossed the border. Soil, water, forest, biodiversity are under great threat. The world leadership doesn't seem to play an effective role in resolving the Rohingya crisis. Mr. Alok Sharma, president of the COP, visited Bangladesh earlier this year and said, I quote, Bangladesh is at risk due to climate change. I have visited the Shundarbans and seen that many people in Bangladesh are living in that area at risk. Millions of people in other parts of the world are also at risk. They need to be helped. But Mr. Sharma's efforts to provide adequate funding, as I mentioned earlier, for the affected countries is yet to be noticed. Sustainable use of natural resource must be ensured without hastening the destruction through arbitrary extraction. Above all, the production system must have to be sustainable, green, and ecology friendly. It is important to get out of the life destroying system and preserve the natural ecosystem, such as forests, rivers, etc., by emphasizing on the balanced relationship between human beings and nature. In this regard, there is no substitute for global cooperation, partnership, and above all, political goodwill. If we were to achieve the SDGs, three decades of progress have been washed away by the COVID-19, and widening inequality is further exacerbated by vaccine nationalism. As many of you know, I try watching a film in every evening. Last night, YouTube popped me a British made for television drama film, The Girl in the Cafe which was first screened on BBC One. The story is of a G8 summit. Lawrence, a senior civil servant working for the Chancellor of Exchequer, falls in love with a young woman uh, by chance in a cafe. Lawrence takes Gina to a G8 summit in Reykjavik, Iceland, where she confronts the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom over the issue of M disease, the early incarnation of the S disease. Poverty, debt, and trade must to Lawrence's embarrassment and the anger of his employers. However, the sub civil servant realize, realizes that she is right and tried to persuade the chancellor and others at the summit to do about the issues concerned. The film ends with a Nelson Mandela quote. I quote, sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. 
you can be that great generation unquote i now pass the back to the able hands of his excellency mr robert chatterton dickson british high commissioner to bangladesh will glasgow hit to the cries of gabura thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you professor uh, for your uh, thought provoking comments uh, may i now call uh, ms sada rizwana hassan chief executive bangladesh environment lawyers association abela to give her speech so the rizwana hassan is an attorney and uh, environmentalist uh, she has particularly focused on regulation for the ship breaking industry in bangladesh and was awarded the goldman environmental uh, prize in uh, 2009 uh, she was also rewarded awarded uh, the raymond maxwell award in 2012 uh, for her uh, uncompromising courage and impassioned leadership in a campaign of judicial activism in bangladesh that affirms uh, the people's right to a good environment as nothing less than the right to dignity and life she has also been dubbed as a hero of environment by the american news magazine time uh, advocate so that is one of them thank you uh, very much dr bhai uh, but putting me after dr titumir is not doing justice to me he has actually been very elaborate and has touched upon almost all the points that i wanted to talk about uh, i'm actually talking to you from bogra because i am out here uh, for a field visit so immediately after my 2 uh, 3 minutes speech i'll have to leave uh, everyone will have to excuse me for that see i see um, as an environmental activist um, and someone who has also visited gabula i see uh, climate crisis as a justice issue and it's also an equity issue and whatever uh, expectations i have from the upcoming uh, cop is from that justice perspective uh, we have heard even our uh, chief uh, even our prime minister saying that if we can't really prevent the emission of greenhouse gases at a satisfactory scale then one third of bangladesh meaning 21 districts of bangladesh will have to go under water and it's being feared that by 2050 we will have many coastal districts disappear from the map of bangladesh which means i'll be forced to redraw the map of my country without having any fault of my own it is not my development model that has led to a crisis like this it is the development model of the Uh, developed countries that has led the world to a crisis like this so i think the first call should be mitigation and we must ensure and particularly considering the recent report that has been given by the ipcc uh, we must uh, ensure that we our ndcs are ambitious enough and we actually go for rigorous implementation of our ndcs so that we really uh, do not face a day when our neighbor maldives will uh, disappear from the atlas when 42 small island countries will disappear from the globe and one third of the land mass of bangladesh will go under uh, sea we certainly don't want to see a day there like this so the call from countries like bangladesh the low lying countries small island countries would be for uh, a higher mitigation uh, standard because even with all the indices implemented will actually not be reaching that 1.5 uh, degree centigrade by the end of this century so in this respect we have to be very 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 ambitious and we have to see some leadership from the western countries because we really haven't seen the expected leadership from a country like us i mean it's back and forth back and forth back and forth uh, so with the science established i think the developed countries should take the onus um of uh, of rectifying the wrong that has been committed to the atmosphere and the developing countries the fast developing countries also follow the path uh, so i would definitely urge for higher uh, uh, higher uh, higher uh, you know standard for controlling our emission and i definitely would like to see more leadership in the western countries now coming down to adaptation i was just reading an article by dr selimul hok maybe today or tomorrow about how the developed countries despite repeated promises have not uh, actually disbursed the committed um, amount but money as it can solve many of our problems it can't solve all of our problems so 
in Gabura, as Ritumir Bhai was saying, there were actually money that was that were diverted for construction and repairing um, the embankments, but the money actually went into someone's pocket. So, the, so while the developed countries must fulfill their promises about disbursing adequate money for us, adequate and new money for us to deal with the adaptation challenges, it's also important that our national government set up a transparent policy so that the money actually reaches the communities, reaches the people who, uh, who uh, need it the most. Uh, we have a climate fund and Bangladesh is actually hailed for having its own uh, climate fund and diverting at least 8% of its um, total budget for uh, uh, tackling climate change. But the fact remains that uh, our, there, are, there are concerns about the projects uh, that are being funded under the climate fund. I mean, it's, it's Bangladesh's fund, that's all right, but it's the fund that's coming from the pocket of the um, taxpayers. So those should actually be going to the people who need it the most, should be going to the coastal people. And Bangladesh should also, the whole world should also rethink the model of development. This model of development is not at all sustainable. Giving you a few statistics, our air is the most polluted air of the world. Our global, our deforestation rate is double the global, uh, double the global deforestation rate. Ninety percent of our agricultural land uh, have lost uh, fertility uh, at, at different scales. So these are really worrying factors for us. So while we press for mitigation, it's also important that we have a very smart, very clear, very bottom-up adaptation place. So that even if the Western countries again fail to deliver the amount of money that they have committed, which in any way is not going to be adequate. We have to ensure that we don't destroy our natural resource bases so that the adaptation choices become limited for us. Um, the the eight five-year plan of the government of Bangladesh in the sector that has dealt with environment has said uh, environment, sustainable development, and environment and climate change. And there Bangladesh has uh, said that there are other developing countries who have adopted the principle of first grow and then clean up. But Bangladesh has been very smart. Bangladesh has not taken that, uh, that path. And Bangladesh is from the very beginning following a green growth model. I think that's, um, that's somewhat a mockery. Given the statistics that we have, I don't think that's the reality. So Bangladesh, my urge to the government of Bangladesh would be not to wait for the money for the foreign governments to give to us, they may again fail. We have to ensure that our natural resource bases are, pro are protected and that those are not destroyed in the name of their development. And we have to actually make that promise of uh, green growth and honest commitment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, CGS advisor, Ms. Soda Rizwana Hassan, uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, from Bogra and uh, for that excellent space. Uh, may I now request Institute of Architects, Bangladesh President Architect uh, Mubashir Hussain to turn on your microphone. Uh, Mr. Hussain uh, is an urban planner and educator. He is currently the President of Commonwealth Association of Architects. He also served as the President of Architects Regional Council Asia, Arkesia. Mr. Mubashir Hussain. আমি প্রথমে এই এত গেনিগুনি ব্যক্তির বক্তব্যের পর আমার বক্তব্যটা খুব স্বাভাবিক আমি আমার দেশটাকে নিয়ে চিন্তা করব সম্প্রতি আমরা করোনার সময় একটি অদ্ভুত জিনিস দেখতে পেয়েছি সারা বিশ্ব একতাবদ্ধ হয়ে করোনার হাত থেকে মুক্তির চেষ্টা করছে কারণ করোনার রিচ পুর কাউকেই চেনে না সে শুধু মানুষকে আক্রান্ত করে অর্থাৎ হিউম্যান বিং অফ দা ওয়ার্ল্ড তার অ্যাটাকের একমাত্র জায়গা ঠিক একইভাবে আমরা যদি চিন্তা করি তাহলে ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জ অনেকটা ধারণা করা হচ্ছে যে গরিব দেশগুলিকে আমি অর্থ দিব যেহেতু তারা ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জের সাথে জড়িত না আমি ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জ করব আমার পয়সা আছে আমার প্রয়োজন আছে এবং গরিবদের গরিবদেরকে আমি অর্থ দিব তোমরা চুপ থাকো আমার মনে হয় এই জায়গা থেকে আমাদেরকে বেরিয়ে আসতে হবে কারণ আজকের আলোচনার মধ্যে প্রতিটি ক্ষেত্রে আমি শুনতে পেয়েছি যে আমাদেরকে অর্থ দিতে হবে আমাদেরকে ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জের ক্ষতি পূরণ দিতে হবে ক্ষতি পূরণের আগে আমাকে আলোচনায় বসতে হবে যে হাউ উই ক্যান স্টপ কার্বন এমিশন যেভাবে করোনাকে করোনার হাত থেকে সারা পৃথিবীকে মুক্ত করার জন্য রিচ অ্যান্ড পোর অল আর ইউনাইটেড কারণ 
রিচ কান্ট্রি জানে যে তাদের দেশ করোনা মুক্ত হলেই তারা মুক্ত থাকতে পারবে না কারণ তাদের দেশে অন্য দেশ থেকে লোক আসবে যেখানে করোনা আছে ঠিক একইভাবে এই ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জ শুধুমাত্র সমুদ্রের পাশে যারা বসবাস করে আইল্যান্ড আছে তাদেরকে এফেক্ট করবে না সারা বিশ্বকে অ্যাট দা এন্ড ইট উইল এফেক্ট সো আমাদেরকে অবশ্য অবশ্যই অবশ্য অবশ্যই যেমন ভাবে আমরা আন্দোলন করছি ঠিক একই পদ্ধতিতে ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জ অর্থাৎ লেটাস ওয়ার্ক शीतकाल ढा शहरे ढा शहर नहीं कथा हाइस्टर इनहेलर बिक्री है এই যে ঢাকা শহরে যত গ্রিন প্ল্যান্ট রয়েছে সেই গাছের পাতাগুলি শীতকালে গাছের পাতাগুলিকে নিয়মিত ধুতে পারি ধুয়ে ফেলতে পারি তাহলেই কিন্তু আমার এই ইনহেলার বিক্রি করার প্রয়োজন থাকবে না কেনারও প্রয়োজন থাকবে না অর্থাৎ কার্বন এমিশন এবং এই গাছগুলি কিন্তু শুধুমাত্র আমাকে অক্সিজেন দেয় না বিনা পয়সা এবং অক্সিজেনের প্রয়োজনীয়তা কোন পরিমাণে কি প্রয়োজন কতটুকু এই করোনা কালীন আমরা কিন্তু টের পেয়েছি অক্সিজেন ছাড়া আমাদের বাঁচার কোনো উপায় নাই এবং এই গাছগুলি আমাকে বিনে পয়সায় অক্সিজেন দেয় আমরা যদি এই শুধু অক্সিজেন দেয় না এই গাছগুলি আমাদের সমস্ত বিষাক্ত গ্যাসগুলি তার নিজের ভিতরে গ্রহণ করে দেয় তাহলে আমার ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জের ধাপ দুটি এটি হচ্ছে সামগ্রিক ভাবে সারা বিশ্বকে নিয়ে আমাকে কাজ করতে হবে একতাবদ্ধ কাজ করতে হবে হ্যান্ড ইন হ্যান্ড টুগেদার কাজ করতে হবে এবং সবাইকে চাইতে হবে যে বাংলাদেশের শুধু না সারা বিশ্বের ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জের ভিতরে আমরা স্টপ করব এবং আস্তে আস্তে পরিবর্তন করে আগের অবস্থায় ফিরে আসব তার জন্য আমাদের অনেকগুলি কাজ করতে হবে যেরকম এলাকা ভিত্তিক প্ল্যান্টেশন এলাকা ভিত্তিক কার্বন এমিশন বন্ধ করা যেমন বাংলাদেশের বিগেস্ট কার্বন এমিশনটা হয় ইটের ম্যানুফ্যাকচারিং এ আমরা আজকে কয়েক বছর থেকে যুদ্ধ করছি যাতে ইট বানানো বন্ধ হয় ইটের বদলে আমরা কংক্রিট ব্লক ব্যবহার করা শুরু করেছি এবং বাংলাদেশ সরকার সিদ্ধান্ত নিয়েছে আমি দু থেকে তিন বছরের ভিতরে আর ব্রিকের কোনো কনস্ট্রাকশন করা হবে না যেটা ভিয়েতনামে অলরেডি করা হয়েছে তো ইন্ডিভিজুয়ালি কান্ট্রিকে কাজ করতে হবে এই ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জকে স্টপ করার জন্য আর সামগ্রিকভাবে সারা বিশ্বের সমস্ত দেশ বিশেষ করে যারা সবচেয়ে বেশি কার্বন এমিশন করছে সেই দেশগুলিকে সাথে নিয়ে যদি আমরা কাজ করতে পারি আমরা অবশ্য অবশ্যই আমি দৃঢ়ভাবে বিশ্বাস করি আমরা ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জের করাল গ্রাস থেকে আমাদের দেশ এবং সারা বিশ্বকে রক্ষা করতে পারবো আবারও বলি লেটাস ওয়ার্ক টুগেদার to achieve carbon emission to zero thank you thank you very much thanks indeed uh, architect mubashir hussain and now let's uh, please welcome our chief guest british high commissioner to bangladesh his excellency uh, robert chatterton dixon uh, before moved to dhaka in march 2019 uh, from september 2018 to january 2019 uh, mr robert was additional director western balkans program uh, in the foreign and commonwealth office from august 2015 to august uh, 2018 uh, he served as a director in the national security secretariat nss in the cabinet office uh, heading the secretariat team supporting the national security council and the national security advisor he was also responsible for consideration of policy on a range of international issues and had led responsibility in nss for the cross government conflict stability and security fund and uh, prosperity fund uh, he was head uh, of the FCO counterterrorism department from 2007 to 2010 and a uh, British ambassador to the Republic of Macedonia from 2004 to 2007 uh, Mr High Commissioner it's over to you His Excellency Robert Chatterton Dixon Well thank you very much indeed Zara and thank you very much for including me in such a distinguished panel today uh, it's been an enormous pleasure to hear the discussion and to hear from the real experts in this and it's been a reminder really of the extraordinary extent uh, of the urban challenges in particular that um, that 
uh, climate change, the climate emergency represents in Bangladesh, but also of the impact that it has on people right throughout the country. And I was very struck in particular by the way that Tabura was used as an example, uh, that, that example at a micro scale of the massive problems that we all face uh, at the macro scale. Um, I thought it was uh, an extremely interesting and actually moving um, presentation because in a way, what we have now in front of us is extraordinary evidence, scientific evidence from the IPCC uh, about the scale of the climate emergency. I mean, the science is absolutely as clear as science ever can be uh, about the scale of the problem and about what will happen uh, if we cannot uh, keep uh, temperatures to the 1.5 commitment made at Paris. The real evidence that we're not going to be able to do that and the very clear signs of what the consequences of that will be. Humanity could not have had uh, a clearer, uh, a clearer scientific demonstration of the problem. And I think also we're seeing all over the world, uh, including here in Bangladesh, uh, real life examples of what, what we are facing. So, I mean, it seems like every, every month for the last several years, we've had, whether it's wildfires in Australia, record extraordinary uh, degrees of heating in places like Canada and Siberia, uh, and floods in Germany. And of course, you know, Bangladesh, a place that has long been in the front line of uh, the climate emergency. Now I think it's clear that the front line is everywhere. So it's a real reminder for us as we take on the responsibility in six weeks' time of hosting uh, the COP summit of the extraordinary responsibility that we have taken on. And I was very pleased, as was mentioned, that Alex Sharma, um, our COP president designate, was able to come to Bangladesh, uh, had a very good series of meetings in June, including with the Honourable Prime Minister, who of course has a global role uh, in uh, all this as the chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And we look forward very much to welcoming her and her delegation uh, to Glasgow, uh, because both in terms of Bangladesh's role as a large and vulnerable country, but also its global leadership role, uh, we really look forward to uh, hearing from, uh, from her and from the Bangladeshi delegation. So it's very, very good to have representatives of that delegation uh, as part of today's event. Um, I think one thing one can say is that Climate Now has really grasped the attention of world leaders. Um, we are in the middle at the moment, as you will know, of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, the general debate that happens every year. Uh, and I think climate, more than any other issue, is the one that has grasped the attention of leaders. And we've had some progress there. Uh, we had, for example, the announcement by President Xi yesterday of China that China would fund no further um, coal-fired uh, electricity uh, outside China uh, and a recommitment uh, on China's own uh, nationally determined contribution, which was very welcome. Um, we also had our own Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has used uh, his uh, attendance at, at uh, UNGA to really highlight the four things that we're trying to achieve uh, as the UK um, through, through COP. And he defined them really very simply as co, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a minute, cash, and I'll talk a bit more about that in just a minute, because there's been a lot of discussion this morning about the role of, of climate finance. Uh, cars, uh, where the switch to electric vehicles is clearly uh, an essential part of, uh, of achieving uh, our climate targets. And finally, trees, uh, which is about protecting communities and natural habitats, and obviously is a crucial part uh, of adaptation um, here in Bangladesh. So I'll just say a little bit about, about each of those. Um, on coal, um, we very much welcome uh, Bangladesh's nationally determined contribution, uh, which includes um, enhanced emissions reduction figures and brings in new sectors, including solid waste and agricultural land management. And we very much hope that as the NDC evolves, uh, it might also potentially uh, come to include a 2050 net zero target, uh, which I recognise is very demanding in the context of Bangladesh, but would be a really excellent uh, way for Bangladesh to demonstrate uh, its commitment uh, on this agenda. And we very much appreciate what we are hearing about the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, which sets out the investments that are needed in practical terms uh, to help reach uh, zero carbon growth. And we'll be working with the government of Bangladesh on the development of a long-term strategy setting out a pathway to net zero. And we look forward to being able to do some work on that politically uh, around uh, work that we will be doing um, ahead of COP26. And there are some things that we also really recognise, which is the uh, accelerated efforts uh, here to phase out coal or to reduce uh, the role of coal. Um, the government's uh, latest energy plans uh, indicate um, 
uh, a greatly reduced uh, role for uh, coal-fired assets. Uh, and they also indicate um, much greater interest and commitment to uh, domestic and international uh, investment in renewables. And as an outsider looking into this debate, it does seem to me that there is a real opportunity regionally uh, for the undoubted, the huge hydro capacity in countries like uh, Bhutan and Nepal, quite close to Bangladesh, uh, to become part of the uh, opportunity for Bangladesh to have a greater part of, its, uh, part of the country's uh, energy from renewable sources. And clearly, uh, there would need to be a regional approach to that because of the different countries through which this energy would need to be imported. But it does seem like there is a real opportunity, uh, both for Bangladesh to benefit from green energy, but also for uh, Bhutan and Nepal to benefit from, from being able to sell uh, clean power uh, to its regional neighbours. So I think on coal, uh, there is, as I said, there's been good progress at, uh, at UNGA, at the UN General Assembly. We very, very much welcome uh, the latest ambitions set out uh, by the government here. But I think it's very important both globally and nationally uh, that we continue to, uh, to press on this uh, because coal is one of the absolutely key, uh, key areas for progress if we're going to try and come close to achieving um, the targets. On cash, um, I mean, I totally recognise what the speakers uh, this morning was saying that the rich world has not yet delivered uh, on its promises. But I think there, is, there are good signs uh, of progress. We've made this a major part of our, uh, of our COP uh, priorities. And um, we've made progress under our G7 presidency. We are also in parallel chair of the G7 uh, uh, industrialised countries. And we've had a doubled commitment from our Canadian partners. Uh, we've had considerable... Uh, increase from uh, both Germany uh, and Japan. And we are going to be using um, the last six weeks ahead of, ahead of uh, COP to uh, really continue to keep up the pressure uh, on our global participants. For our own perspective, we've committed to double our international climate finance to nearly 12 billion pounds. So that's about uh, $16 billion uh, over the 2021 to 2025 period. Uh, with 50% of this allocated to adaptation uh, and 3 billion to protecting nature. And both of those, of course, highly relevant uh, here in Bangladesh. And we're also uh, working with uh, the Bangladeshi system here to try and open up systems which will enable greater degrees of private finance uh, to flow into adaptation investment, which we think is really essential to maintain the progress that's being made here uh, towards, uh, towards maintaining economic growth while at the same time uh, investing in uh, adaptation uh, and in mitigation. So in terms of coal, as I said, progress being made, further to go. I think the same is true of cash. And I think in some ways, as someone who's seen many international negotiations in my diplomatic career, it's not all that surprising that we haven't reached the target yet, because very often it's the sort of final stages of preparation uh, for these events, uh, where you see uh, the real money being put on the table. So I totally acknowledge that there is further to go, but I think that the political context between the UN General Assembly happening now uh, and COP happening at the beginning of November, I think there's a real chance that we will uh, get to the headline figure that we, uh, that we need uh, to get to. Um, I won't dwell a lot on cars um, because clearly Bangladesh is at the early stage of, uh, uh, of transition uh, in terms of vehicles. I would note though that if a transition from uh, fossil fuel powered vehicles to electric vehicles can be achieved, that would also have a major impact on the wider environmental problem here, which is obviously uh, a significant uh, problem of urban pollution uh, in Dhaka. And that transition would obviously benefit both uh, climate mitigation, uh, but would also benefit the urban environment that we all live in and certainly recognise, I think, particularly uh, in the winter months, that uh, there is a very major problem with urban pollution here. And as I say, a, a transition on cars could also help that. Um, and then finally, on trees, um, I mean, Alex Sharma, when he came here, as one of the speakers has already mentioned, uh, made a visit uh, to the Sundarbans, uh, because the Sundarbans, I think, in many ways, is a really good example of the role that nature can play uh, in adaptation, uh, because preserving and protecting uh, the Sundarbans is obviously a contribution on biodiversity, uh, it obviously uh, contributes to uh, the role of mangrove, the world's largest, uh, or certainly Asia's largest existing mangrove forest, uh, as a pool of uh, carbon, as a carbon soak, if you like, 
Uh, but it also shows how um, the Sundarbans plays an extraordinary role in protecting uh, southwest Bangladesh from uh, tropical storms like Amphan. And I think we've seen very, very recent examples of how the intact forest has an enormously uh, beneficial role uh, in all aspects of, of both adaptation and mitigation. So I was very pleased that Alex Sharma was able to see the Sundarbans at first hand and recognise the extraordinary opportunity that Bangladesh has to continue to protect the Sundarbans uh, and, to, uh, and, and to make it, as I said, both part of mitigation and also uh, part of uh, adaptation. So it's an enormously exciting um, agenda here. I recognise that there are major challenges uh, on uh, power and on uh, ensuring uh, the ability of this country to keep growing uh, while uh, playing its part in global uh, mitigation. But I think real progress is being made there. And as I said, I think there is real progress also being made on making sure that the rich world meets its, uh, its cash targets on climate finance. Um, just briefly, um, I'd like to say a little bit at the end about um, the way in which the UK and Bangladesh have a major partnership in this area. Uh, we have launched, uh, we launched last year um, a climate partnership because there's a lot of opportunity for us to learn um, from each other. We've held a series of high-level virtual forums, uh, both on specific COP26 goals, but also on the wider uh, issues uh, surrounding the whole climate and environment agenda here, because we have a lot to learn, uh, in particular on adaptation, as well, I think, in the UK, there's a lot of expertise that we can offer in terms of all sorts of issues, including um, solar-powered mini-grids, which can be fed into the national grid, uh, solid waste and medical waste management, which obviously is an important part of the wider environmental issue here, uh, promotion of recycling, um, and also um, playing a part in enabling young people here, who of course are the most directed, the people with the biggest personal investment in this whole agenda, uh, to make their voices heard. And we're about to launch, we hope, um, a larger climate and environment programme which will cover adaptation and resilience, uh, as well as renewal en renewable energy, uh, environmental management uh, and, and partnerships. So, so it's a very exciting agenda here. I think we're into a really, uh, we're obviously now into the final stages of preparing for COP. Um, it's a big logistical challenge anyway, hosting the summit. Um, there's obviously a, a particular challenge hosting the summit in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm very pleased that we have, as, as the first speaker mentioned, uh, been able to take uh, Bangladesh off our red list, which will clearly enable both uh, effective Bangladeshi participation uh, at COP, which we absolutely uh, welcome and look forward to, um, but also the wider people-to-people uh, -people contact, business-to-business -business contact that we need uh, to develop the wider uh, climate and environmental relationship uh, between um, our two countries. And I just end by saying that this is, an, uh, this is, a, this is a, huge, a huge issue for everyone, of course, everyone who inhabits planet Earth, which is all of us. But I think it's, it's really extraordinary how this agenda, more than any other, uh, now grips the world, because we've had so many examples, uh, as I said, of, uh, of, of the real impact of climate that we're living with. And I think you know, what we're now seeing uh, at the General Assembly and elsewhere is the way in which more than any other issue, this one is right at the top. COVID is a very big tactical issue. It's one where there's clearly a lot of immediate problems that are being created. But I think when we look at the deep, the deep issues that are driving the international system at the moment, then climate is right at the top. And what we would need to do as chair of COP is to convert that political energy that we've seen very manifest uh, at, uh, at the UN General Assembly. And we see all around us, uh, I probably discuss climate more than any other single issue uh, with, uh, with people uh, here in Bangladesh, both in the government and more widely. I think it's converting that political energy into the outcomes at COP in six weeks' time that we all know are going to be needed if the Paris commitments uh, are going to be met. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. As I said, it's a very exciting, very fast moving agenda. And it's great that there is so much expertise and so much passion on this issue uh, here in Bangladesh. And it's always a privilege to talk to Bangladeshi colleagues and partners about the issue. So thank you very much and um, for a really productive discussion and look forward to continuing it in other formats uh, over the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency, for your wonderful speech. Uh, we have learned a lot uh, from the uh, host country point of view. Uh, we wish a uh, successful COP26 uh, and our best wishes uh, to the host country, the United Kingdom and its people.
Uh, now I'd like to request the for governance studies CSA chairman, Dr. Munjur Ahmed Choudhury, uh, to con conclude this webinar. As you all know, that he's a well-known uh, entomologist uh, of this country. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jill Rahman. His Excellency, Mr. Robert Chatterton Dixon, distinguished panelist and participants. I thank you all for participating in this uh, important uh, webinar. Uh, climate change is an issue that uh, affects most of us in this country and also all over the world. Uh, you know, Bangladesh is a frontline country as far as um, climate change is concerned. Uh, uh, two thirds of Bangladesh is less than five meter elevation. So if there is a just a 50 centimeters sea level rise, 14, 11% uh, of Bangladesh will go down. Uh, you will be inundated. About 15 million people will be directly affected. And uh, these will be the uh, climate uh, refuses. We are already facing Rohingya refuses. If now we have to face the climate refuses, then it will be a tremendous pressure on our socio-economic uh, uh, condition. You know, there were a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, initiatives all over the world for the last uh, several decades. So we had the Rio summit, we had Kyoto protocol. Now we have Paris agreement, Paris accord. We are now going to discuss, Bangladesh is going to uh, be represented by our prime minister in the uh, conference of participants in Glasgow. There will be a lot of discussions Probably the most important issues in this uh, uh, COP26 will be the, uh, the financing of climate mitigation and climate uh, adaptation, and also the carbon trading. We in Bangladesh contribute only 0.3% of uh, total global emission. Yet, we have to face this most severe serious consequences uh, of uh, global warming. If there is 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, then still there will be a lot of consequences for adverse effects uh, on our uh, lives and livelihood. Already we have uh, more frequent uh, cyclones, more severe cyclones. You know, we have also these, uh, you know, uh, uh, inundation in our, in our coastal area. A lot of people are displaced uh, because of this uh, flooding and uh, already actually we have if you take a uh, you know uh, you know sponsors sensors then there will be already a lot of people are actually climate refuses they are living in the slums of uh, Dhaka and other places what is the main reason for this global warming is the is the increased uh, emission carbon emission greenhouse gases and why there is so much greenhouse gases because there is a real disparity between the high income uh, countries and uh, low income countries in the consumption of energy. I will just give one simple example, the World Bank data a few years old that in the USA, per capita electricity consumption is close to 13,000 kilowatt hour. In UK, it is about 5,000 kilowatt hour. But you know what in Bangladesh, it is 320 kilowatt hour. Yet we are being asked to, uh, you, know, continue, uh, you know, reduce emission. We, we have, uh, we don't uh, emit much. There are also many other aspects, many other products which, uh, you know, uh, which directly contribute to the uh, emission of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide uh, emission, uh, where our contribution is very, is insignificant. So, it is not only the financing of a uh, hundred billion dollar per year. That's uh, that's what we are asking for. We are emphasizing on financing. We have to also emphasize on the uh, attitude uh, of the attitude of the high income countries about the reduction of their energy consumption. There were movements in the USA in during the early 80s by you know H. Uh, T. Odom and also in India by Omar Mukhani, that everyone, everyone in this 
in this world should be given an energy budget that you are entitled to use so much uh, kilocalorie of energy. In that way, there will be a real, real equity, equity, equity in, uh, you know, in contributing uh, the uh, you know, global emission and global warming. So it is not only the financing, it is not only that what we can do, what Western countries can do to reduce their level of energy consumption. With that note, I would like to thank you all for participating in this conference. On behalf of uh, Center for Governance Studies, I again uh, thank His Excellency Mr. Dixon and uh, others to participate in this, for participating in this important uh, webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to our chief guest, uh, His Excellency Robert Chatterjee Dixon, uh, to all our speakers today, and thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, goodbye and good luck.